Hey folks, so today's topic is a bit spicy due to a gift I received from Batsfine. Specifically, Bats bought me a copy of Pixel Tai Shoko and Librahart's newest lewd Metroidvania, Castle in the Clouds DX. If those devs sound familiar, you may recognize them as the creators of Midnight Castle Succubus DX, an equally titillating title in the Metroidvania genre. Don't worry though, since I'm not trying to speedrun getting banned from Twitch and YouTube, all the footage was recorded in safe work mode. Yes, that's an option. Which begs the question, did Castle in the Clouds provide a satisfying ride from start to finish, or was it a flaccid experience without the filth? I'm your host Arlian, let's find out together. Now narratively speaking, Castle in the Clouds is straightforward enough. You take the role of the bounty hunter, Lily, whose attempt at bringing a bandit chief into captivity meets with abject failure. She's beaten, robbed, and utterly humiliated, and yet her story doesn't end there. Instead, she wakes up at the end of a nearby town, having been rescued by its mayor. What's more, the villagers are more than happy to provide her with a steady supply of bounty work, providing her the money and means to get even with the bandits that it cost her. And along the way, she might just happen to find herself immersed in the hunt for an ancient castle. Admittedly, I didn't really find things relative to the castle to be especially plot relevant, with the majority of its backstory being contained within a handful of optional lore-heavy books. But since it is how the game culminates, I figured it needed to be mentioned. Just like how I feel obliged to mention that the game's conclusion might be a touch... obtuse. I mean, the bad ending is very straightforward to get but the basic good ending is something you're more apt to stumble across accidentally and more out of convenience than anything else. And the best ending, well, I hope you enjoy exploring mazes. And that's about all I feel comfortable chatting about, since while there are differences between how the safe for work and not safe for work versions play out narratively, uh, well, Let's just say there's some serious bits of non-consensual non-consent going on, and that sort of thing would get me demonetized faster than Midnight Castle Succubus's thumbnail did. Still, while there are some salacious story beats omitted in safe for work mode, the gameplay experience is largely the same, beyond a quick 4K you can make at the start for reasons I can't go into. Essentially, Castle in the Clouds is a stage-based platformer with some Metroidvania elements introduced to the mix. Once you've made the fateful decision between sword or whip, you're thrust right into an introductory level, and from the get-go, there are some notable differences from its predecessor. For instance, not only does jumping generally feel better, you're also able to attack in all eight cardinal directions without tracking down upgrades. You also don't have the sub-weapon system anymore, and with it, your ability to just turn gold into endless time-stop abuse. Instead, your brutally acquired booty is strictly used in the town hub area for padding out your arsenal of weapons and to stay at the inn. Now, given that combat's fairly straightforward, acquiring new weapons does feel nice, but not all weapons are created equal. For instance, while I dug the sword, later variants of the whip outstripped it in strength and range, making it utterly irrelevant. And yet absolutely everything pales in comparison to the raw strength of the magic staff. This weapon is so utterly broken that it makes the rest of the game a cakewalk if you invest in it. I'm talking about spammable, high damage projectiles that not only pierce through enemies, but also home in on them once you've found a late game upgrade. It's dumb, though perhaps not quite as dumb as the axe, and not for the same flattering reasons either. Like yes, it's technically a strong weapon. That said, it's also incredibly slow, clunky, and grossly expensive which makes it sort of insulting if you ignore it, only to realize it's required to progress through the game at a certain point. Sure hope you didn't spend all your money before you realize this. I mean, yes, the game throws money at you to progress deeper into the game, and also in notably large lump sums whenever you clear an area, so scooping it up isn't too hard. But it's sort of counterintuitive if you've been investing in magic weapons, or when you take into consideration just how generous the game is with the other upgrades you need, provided you're diligently exploring. For instance, there's both a double jump and a wall jump accessible within the first area of the game. They're just there for you to find, alongside a utility item that lets you see the damage numbers you're doing. And that's just the icing on the cake. There's an absolute truckload of movement abilities to discover later on, which all feel distinct and rewarding. Like, it's incredibly satisfying to acquire the ability to wall climb, 
only to then transition to hanging onto the ceiling like some sort of sexy, sexy Spider-Man. Suddenly an array of shortcuts and pathways open up to you, and not only are you enabled to explore new locations and find new secrets, you're also given new avenues to cleverly sneak by enemies or to engage them. Unfortunately, while these elements are fun to use, they can be a bit tricky to find at times, since, as I said, they're hidden in each of the game's various stages, and often in areas which are completely tangential to reaching its boss. And though you're equipped with a map of the area, there aren't any indications as to whether or not you've missed items in a given room or any form of map marker. Which is to say, it absolutely behooves you to explore each of the game's stages thoroughly, because it's entirely possible to find your progression majorly hindered or even halted because you missed something scrolled away in a nook. Still, the abundance of secrets to find meant that this was generally a rewarding process. For instance, there's a lot of hidden cash just sort of scattered about, but there's also hidden hearts to be found in each level. Not only do these one-time collectibles provide a full heal, they also boost your maximum health by an increasing amount with each one found. In fact, if you find all of them, you'll reach the maximum health cap of 9,999, turning you into an absolute juggernaut. And since the healing item consumables you find heal you based on percentage, yeah, these are good. It also just provides you ample opportunities to gather those coins you need and beat up enemies for some sweet levels, because yes, there's RPG elements. Are you sure you can't do anything with those levels until you reach the hub town, but once you make it there, you can stay at the inn. Not only does this heal you to full for a cheap price, it also lets you spend the ability points you've been earning. Though, the stats might not be the most well-balanced element. First off, Constitution is a weird one because it provides you a very small defense boost and a bonus to health you find from collectible hearts. You know, the things that'll cap out your health even without an investment and leave you an absolute unit. Luck, on the other hand, amplifies all the experience you acquired and is really nice for getting an early leg up on becoming absolutely busted. Which just leaves agility, intelligence, and strength. Agility does let you attack faster, but it also caps out at something like 73, or potentially less than that when you find a certain stat boosting item. Which just leaves the choice between dumping all your points either in physical or magical damage, and calling it a day. Which, yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, and if you're absolutely tripping over cash, by the way, you do have options. For one thing, you can rent out the expensive rooms in order to access Dream Worlds, with stat boosters in them, and it also unlocks the next one in the line. Like, there's a pretty neat quest chain involved in all this that has a great payoff at the end, but once you've exhausted that, well, you can just stuff all your spare gold into boosting your max health in case you're not up to heart hunting. Screw the rules, I have money! Still, while all these things do impact the game's overall difficulty curve, I still found myself having a good time. Each of the game's areas have an altogether different feeling, and the manner in which they incorporate both the older movement mechanics as well as the new ones, and a fresh array of obstacles and enemies, meant I stayed invested. The bosses at the end of each area were a lot of fun as well, though I'll admit the overall difficulty levels vary wildly. For instance, the boss at the end of the tree level is a conceptually interesting encounter, but the execution for it didn't really leave my pulse pounding. Inversely, the Ice Cave boss has a fairly interesting and varied moveset that she'll cycle through over the course of her fight, though it's also entirely possible to miss out on the crux of this encounter due to the sheer force of arms you have to bear at this point, because it is during this point of the game that you really get a chance to pop off with better gear and experience levels. Honestly, it's for this reason that one of my most memorable boss encounters was when I went head-to-head -head with the bandit boss near the start of the game while underleveled and wielding the default sword. Suffice to say, I was obliged to thoroughly learn her patterns if I wanted a hope of victory, and yet this made gradually whittling down her health bar satisfying and tense. Though I think part of that tension is because it took me till the end of the game to realize there was no death penalty despite having the game's difficulty set to hard. And speaking of hard... I agonized over how to go over the visual differences between safe for work and not safe for work for a bit, and no, those portraits are visible in both. The game's not shy about showing off some thigh or jiggle physics. Honestly though, it just looks good in a general sense, from its area design, to the overall animations for our curvy heroine, and the array of antagonists she needs to face off against. 
Designs which are for the most part consistent between safe work and not safe work, beyond the final boss shedding clothes as her phases shift. That said, there are a number of animations and scenes omitted from safe for work mode, whether it's some of those, uh, questionable plot elements I glossed over earlier to some wireistic scenes in town, though this does lead to some mechanical changes. For instance, not safe for work mode has trapped succubi chests which curse the protagonist with urges. Inversely, safe for work mode just makes those chests normal. This difference also omits the animations that normally play when you stumble into the environmental tentacles. Instead, they just give you a quick source of screen-wide damage scaled to the number of times you've run into one, which is great for leveling. I mean, the damage burst is still there and not safe for work mode. You just work your way to the big finish. Anyways, with the visual nuances out of the way, I will say I legitimately enjoyed this game's soundtrack. It's a great deal of fun, and it definitely provided, like, a really good vibe as you were going forward through all the areas. And yeah, no, I'm just leaving the judgment of the looter sound effects to you guys. Feel free to leave your degenerate ratings in the comments. Which means we're at the climax. Boo! Sorry. But yeah, if you couldn't tell, I did find myself thoroughly charmed by Castle in the Clouds, and this is despite my general apprehension when it comes to a hentai's gameplay. As a spiritual successor to Midnight Castle, it's a great deal of fun, and my biggest regret is simply, there wasn't more of it, and more boss fights, I really did enjoy those. Sure, as a story light experience, I found the narrative more of an afterthought, but the mechanics kept me stoked throughout, and I found myself thoroughly exploring each area to the best of my ability. So I say Castle in the Clouds DX is definitely a hit in my book, especially since I actually found myself motivated to run through it a second time around to mop up the achievements I missed, albeit now armed with a pair of unlockable characters because New Game Plus not only affords you a bunch of cheats in a boss rush mode, it also provides you two new ways to smear your opposition. Though, if you want any sort of challenge, stick with the band. Anywho, thanks for tuning in. If you agree, disagree, or just have something to say to me, feel free to leave a comment. And if you enjoy my efforts to create new indie reviews, interviews, and gaming content, feel free to share this, but also hit the subscribe button and the bell so you know there's a new release. For the Discord savvy folks, click the video description to find a link to my community, the Critic Cauldron, and you can also find a link to my Patreon so you can support me and the other members of Crit Hit. Lastly, if you want to see me get dunked on in Indie Games Live, check out my Twitch at twitch.tv slash That said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Crit Hit. Take care till then, folks.